Hey guys, Montel here, and welcome to this edition of Let's Be Blunt with Montel. I am so excited to have the guest that I have on that's coming up in a few minutes. Before we get him on, I want to just say a couple of little comments. And I don't know if you've been watching and paying attention to the news lately, but over the last couple of weeks, everybody from the HSS to FDA, everybody has kind of, you know, uh, stepped into the fray making comments about the viability of possibly rescheduling cannabis from a Schedule 1 drug to maybe even a Schedule 3 drug. And you know, there has been a lot of pushback, and I think necessarily so, a lot of pushback by a lot of consumers out there who are saying that if they reschedule this to a Schedule 3 drug, I'm out. I'm out of the dispensary business. I'm going to jump into going back to the illicit market because, one, why would we trust a bunch of people who for the last 30 years have said there's never no viability to cannabis now all of a sudden being the producers of the same product that they said there was no viable medical efficacious reason for even using cannabis? So now all of a sudden we're going to trust an, an, uh, an organization that we know doesn't really, I don't know if their top priority is the patient or their top priority is making money. And so therefore what products will they come up with and how will states actually allow for the dispensary system to, to stay in place when now all of a sudden something becomes a schedule three drug that has to be prescribed by prescribed by a doctor, which they don't get to do right now. But let's say it becomes prescribable by a doctor. That means that you have to go to a pharmacy, not a dispensary, a pharmacy to get it up, to get it. And what kind of products will they offer? And will they destroy the entire branded, you know, marketplace that's out there right now and as robust as it has been. And although we know that our legal marketplace is robust, I mean looking back at 2021, $25 billion plus legal marijuana and cannabis was sold in the United States, but we know that the illegal market was probably pushing somewhere near $75 billion worth of product being sold in the United States. So what's going to happen if all of a sudden we switch from schedule one to schedule three, you know, there's a, a report that was out and this is in marijuana moment. I'll read you a little bit out of it. It says about one third of marijuana consumers say that they will go back to the illicit market. If cannabis was rescheduled and only made legal, uh, available as a Food and Drug Administration FDA approved prescription drug, according to a new poll. As federal agencies work to complete an administrative review on cannabis rescheduling, the survey from Nug MD shows wariness about the government, how the government could hypothetically become involved with marijuana in the event of its reclassification. Of course, even though the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has recommended moving cannabis from Schedule 1 to Schedule 3 of the Controlled Substances Act, that would make it a legal prescription drug. The FDA approval process is separate, so the agency typically does not approve botanicals as prescription medications. And many industry observers also believe that the federal government will continue to approach its approach of generally allowing state markets to operate without interference Following rescheduling, though, some advocates and consumers have concerns that the change could disrupt state licensed businesses by allowing pharmaceuticals to take over the marijuana industry. And Nug Survey underscores that point. And when we take a look at, you know, what's going on in places around the country, I mean, I just, you know, hopefully we'll soon have product in the marketplace in Georgia. And this is one of those situations where as of as early as much as a month ago, uh, as recently as a month ago, you know, uh, the, the FDA, it's not the FDA, I'm sorry, the DEA had sent the notice out to all the independent pharmacists in Georgia who had signed on to being able to dispense cannabis through their, their pharmacies. The DEA sent notices out saying, stop, don't pass go. You better not do this because if you do, we're going to come down on your head. Now, all of a sudden, the same organization is going to turn around and say, oh, no, nah, never mind. We're going to let the pharmacists, not just independent pharmacies, but let's say the big CVSs of the world start carrying cannabis. And who's CVS hiring? Are they going to hire people who have been in the legacy market for a long time who understand this plan? Or are they going to go to this new, I don't know what you want to call it, you know, burgeoning, you know, group of people who think they are educated enough in this space provide a quality product to patients. I think the argument still stands very, very strong in the in favor of 
let's skip the de- the reschedule and let's go straight to descheduling since it has been, you know, uh, the mindset of the FDA to not even prescribe a botanical. Uh, that's normally in the nutraceutical realm. Why not put cannabis in the nutraceutical realm and then, you know, uh, put some restraints on how it's sold there. And you could do so by saying can't be sold to people under the age of 18 or whatever. I mean, I can understand that. But I do not understand this idea of turning this over to a whole bunch of people who for the last 30 years have tried to fight this and knowing how hard they try to fight it makes me wonder how much they would really support the products that they're selling, even if they get an opportunity to sell themselves. I'm delighted to have uh, our esteemed guest on today and I want to introduce you, I guess, with over 15 years of experience as an attorney, an educator, a strategist dedicated to the fight for human rights. His multifaceted practice extends across public, nonprofit, social, and entrepreneurship sectors. Through litigation and public policy and advocacy and community organization, he has diligently worked in a meaningful partnership with individuals and communities. His remarkable expertise also encompasses being a seasoned cannabis policy advocate and serving as the chief impact officer at On the Rebel. Jason Starr, I want to welcome you to Let's Be Blunt with Montel, sir. Thanks for being a part of the show today. Thank you for having me, Montel, to all the listeners and watchers out there, too. Uh, thanks for being a part of this beautiful, beautiful plant family. Absolutely. And look, you know, Jason, before we get started, why don't you share a little bit about your background, about your upbringing, your education, you know, where you're from, you know, uh, and any background you'd like to share with us. Let us know. Yeah, well, I'm a, I'm a, um, I'm a country boy at heart that's found my way in the the, the big city. I grew up uh, in rural upstate South Carolina, uh, big, uh, large, extended, you know, Southern family. My grandfather was a farmer and a mill worker. Uh, I grew up in a, a textile town, textile town in, in old cotton country. Um, so, so a lot of, um, Playing around in the dirt, uh, a lot of growing and and, and canning our own food. Um, I'm a I'm a kid of the late '80s and early '90s, so um, definitely uh, influenced by you know the the early TV and video age, um, early internet age, if you will. But um, also, um, I say I came from a land that was 30 or 40 years uh, behind uh, the rest of. The rest of the country, it seems. So, so this real connection to 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 old um, practices and the old way of doing things um, is it was a big part of uh, my my experience growing up too. Where'd you go to school? Where'd you graduate? Yeah, so I I flew south, um, further south, uh, if you will, and went uh, to college at the University of Miami. Uh, go go Hurricanes um, and. Uh, studied um, formally economics, but what I tell everybody is that I really majored in leadership and I learned the most about um, how I wanted to be in the world uh, from the experiences I had um, in like student activities and community leadership. Um, I stayed, I stuck around South Florida for a couple of years after college to, um, as a public school teacher, I taught, I taught pre-algebra and algebra eighth and ninth grade um, in uh, inner city Miami um, and really got a flavor for you know the way that um, systems do harm on uh, black and brown folks, poor folks, um, uh, in the context of you know being in a, a classroom, uh, which I think uh, shines a light on so many of the ways in which our institutions in in um, in this country um, create and perpetuate disparity. Um, and then uh, 17 years ago, uh, came up to New York um, and, and for law school, and you know thought I would. Uh, uh, launch a career here and, and then and then move on like so many other people do. Um, but the Big Apple got into my spirit. And so uh, I made my home here in Brooklyn for the last uh, 17 years. Great. Absolutely. And now um, let, let's dive right in and, and get busy because let's talk a little bit about, you know, what uh, inspired you to get involved with cannabis? Well, I would say I come to the work as a consumer first and foremost. I discovered um, cannabis really in in college, um, and it was uh, social. You know, I was this sort of country kid who had never really been anywhere, um, and here I am now on this campus in South Florida, in this you know world class city with 
um, uh, the globe kind of uh, in our uh, in our hands. Um, uh, and so um, I shared many, you know, meeting many new people and and, and endeavoring in new experiences together um, uh, over cannabis. It was communal. Um, and 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 later, you know, in life, really thinking about um, how much it became a part of my personal therapeutic um, practices as well. Um, but from a policy perspective, I came in through discriminatory policing practices. I was working at the ACL, ACLU of New York around 2012 when formerly involved in in um, policing, and what we were really seeing was all of these dis these disparities in terms of um, uh, in terms of stop, question, and frisk, um, we're really driven in large part by um, low-level marijuana enforcement. Now we had um, decriminalized small, simple possession, you know, small possession uh, of marijuana in New York in 1977, right? And yet in 2011, you still had uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, individual summons uh, issued uh, for misdemeanors uh, because you know, with stop and frisk, cop goes up says empty your pockets, someone does, they have a joint inside, the joint inside their pocket was a violation, the joint outside of their pocket was a misdemeanor. So poor drafting of the law, really disrupting and frustrating the purposes of what was set out in 1977. And we also know that in New York, they were definitely targeting people oh, of color. Oh, you know, absolutely. The same number of, of people who weren't of color down Wall Street being, were never stopped as frisked. And even if they were stopped and where they were standing out on the street corner, cops would normally just give them a pass, let them go. The brown and black people, they put them through the system. Right. And I mean, the smell of marijuana being used um, as probable cause or reasonable suspicion to engage in further you know, stops and searches. You're absolutely right. And New York is a very interesting place in that way because we um, are, you know, we live in such a dense environment, right? We have a high concentration of public housing, a high concentration of folks living in apartment buildings uh, in private housing. And so when you ask yourself like who's available, <laughs> right? Um, where, where, do, where do those enforcement efforts dovetail with where people are consuming cannabis? Obviously people who are smoking outside because they have to, people who are not smoking at home because they live or consuming at home in any way because they live in public housing and have um, uh, all of the issues that come with that with regard to federal uh, scheduling and criminalization. Um, so I feel like this issue is even more manifest. Um, we see it across the country, you know, in places where people drive more, right? Um, and you see those disparities in traffic stops. Um, but really, you're absolutely right. You're all, it was all about taking what we knew. Um, there was a real light on um, how the NYPD was wrecking communities and really young people's lives with these stops and frisks. Um, and tying it to um, the ways in which um, marijuana enforcement was related to that. So that really was the, the 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 genesis, I think, of the legalization movement in New York. Certainly, we were working on municipal decrim strategies and 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 and, and medical legalization, um, or what I'd like to call softening a prohibition, right? But the real full throated effort at um, creating a statewide campaign around legalization was really born out of um, the, the stop and frisk. Work. Yeah, you know, I, I was involved uh, in the testimony a couple of times before New York legislature back in 1991. I'm sorry, yeah, uh, no, 1992. And then again in 2000, um, I had testified um, uh, uh, before legislature when, you know, they were getting ready to pass right back when. Or was it the, the prosecutor, the Manhattan prosecutor was Morgenthau. Um, and I, Morgenthau yeah. yeah, a long, long time ago, uh, you know, New York was at least looking at it. But, you know, I think the powers that be that recognize that they had a better re-enslavement tool by putting brown and black people <laughs> all reaching in their pockets. They, they could put more of us in jail, feed into that industrial complex of, you know, prisons. That is, that's been the same across the country. We've looked at places like even California that's had legal, some form of legal marijuana for what, over 20 years, and still look at the numbers that have been arrested and still are getting arrested in California. Yes, cannabis yes. yes. And, and Montel, I have to tell you too that, um, so, so after I left the ACLU, um, uh, interestingly enough, uh, I found myself in the governor's office for two and a half years. Um, in large part, um, because, you know, when you're on the advocate side, as you know, a lot of times you put forth these very um, 
uh, strategic and effective efforts to galvanize communities, to develop a narrative, to put power around a policy idea, but you have to work with a bureaucrat or an elected official or somebody behind that curtain. And what I realized over the first six years of my career is that we're handing that good work off to somebody, but we don't know what happens and why it fails on the inside. So I found myself in government and having responsibility for this file uh, from 2017 to 2019. Uh, and I met you uh, in Albany um, at a panel uh, during uh, Black Caucus weekend. I think it was February 2018, uh, where you were, um, as you always are, preaching the, the cannabis gospel. So uh, it comes full circle. It comes full circle. Well, look, my friend, let's 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 do, let's dive in deep. You've seen some of the, the articles that I'm talking about from the FDA, from the DE, well, the HSS, FDA to the DEA, the DOJ, all talking about, you know, rescheduling. As a matter of fact, a couple of weeks ago, a couple of articles came out from both FDA and, and HSS verifying the legitimacy of the medical aspects of cannabis. So disputing those laws that, of course, it has no medical value, even though we know it's had medical value since the fact that the federal government signed and gave itself a patent on CBD and other cannabinoids back in 2002. They wrote itself, they, they talked about it themselves in their abstract for their patent application about how efficacious cannabis was for a myriad of things. I've always thought that this was, again, I've, I've, I've kind of constantly said to those in this in industry, be careful what you're doing. And why? Because the Fed owns the patent. And if the Fed and they've extended that patent multiple times. So now if that if they decided tomorrow to say, OK, we're going to reschedule schedule three. Anybody selling any marijuana in the United States is violating the patent held by the United States government. Bingo, bango. Every dispensary in the country has to come to, to a screeching halt. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the federal scheduling um, uh, question, I, the first thing that's very curious to me, um, and I think we should interrogate, obviously, is timing. Right. I mean, there's no new information that HHS uh, or its um, various component sub-agencies um, have come to realize. Um, well, well they, they do claim that recent, in, recent, uh, uh, um, oh, it was not trials, they didn't say recent trials, they said something silly like, you know, recent breakthroughs in, in medical technologies confirmed as efficacious. And some, they, they use some nebulous thing like as if just last week they figured this out. Yeah. Right, right, and we know that we know the literature um, uh, on this has been out out there for 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 a long time. So, so I say that only to say um, there is a very important election coming up, and uh, for the party in power and the people in power, um, you know, certainly movement on this issue. Uh, particularly for young people, for independents, for voting blocks that need to be activated, you know. Yeah, when you when you say the current administration, you're saying, I don't know if you're talking about Biden or you're talking about the guys that people think is, I, I don't know, but I'm going to tell you something. The current one to me, and I've confirmed this from my own perspective, is that I think they're full of shit, to be honest with you. Remember, during the entire lead up to uh, 2020, I heard well, within the first 100 days of being in office, we're going to, out of his mouth and out of Kamala's mouth, we're going to do something about rescheduling. Now it is 100 days or a couple hundred days before they're out, then now all of a sudden they, they're they kind of indicating through these things that have come out from HSS and from FDA that they are in favor of possibly rescheduling. But you've got a president who literally three weeks into this administration said he still thought cannabis was a gateway drug. Stop the ignorance. And you got Kamala Harris lying about whether or not she used it or not. Stop the ignorance. Let's start telling the truth. First off, this younger generation has had enough. They're tired of watching their friends go to jail. They're tired of watching people, even right now, in states that have legal marijuana on the books, places like Illinois, places like California, depending on the municipality, if they didn't make it legal, you drive across the street from one light to the next, you can get arrested in that same state. There are still people being arrested in California. For Cal, for Cal, I'm sorry, I get I get angry about this, but so so I mean, when we're thinking about an administration, you know, I was hoping, and and I and I really do feel like whoever comes to the table first and says I'm going to definitely change the cannabis laws, they are going to get an entire generation of votes that they would not have gotten. And don't believe that Donald Trump isn't looking at that because the only thing that stopped him from doing it is trying to figure out whether or not either Uday or Kuse, you know, his two sons, one of them can get in the business first. When he allows <laughs> him to get in the business first, then he's going to, of course, make sure he knows he can make some money off of it. 
bingo, bango, next thing you know, cannabis will be legal. I think that's right. I mean, it may be my government experience. You know, I worked for in the, in the executive branch um, for a um, a personality type that some that some argue is quite similar to Trump um, in in a lot of ways. And and you're right, right? Like wh who's ever holding the bag when when something gets over the finish line often gets associated with, and of course gets the political benefit of of doing the thing, right? You know, so. You know, we did fifteen dollar minimum wage in 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 New York, or paid family leave, and people associate those things with Andrew Cuomo. And you know, you and I both know it's really the the people who lived, you know, for years and years and years and years and years, uh, and used that lived experience to um, to inform and drive uh, change over the, the 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 long haul. You know, one of the things that you said at the top of the program, right, was that even in those legal market states. Um, you're seeing we're seeing revenues um, value in, in, in market values totaling what twenty five billion dollars. So when we talk too about the disconnect between you know the federal government generally, the Biden administration specifically, Congress, and also what these young people um, and maybe even not so young people are seeing um, as it relates to who's benefiting from that now um, and who's still being burdened, uh, both with the way things um, have happened in the past as it relates to enforcement, but also, as you mentioned, the things that are continuing to happen, notwithstanding the fact that um, a lot of people, um, most of them male and white, are um, now you know, cashing in um, uh, in ways that, that, that communities uh, of color you know, can't even conceptualize. Oh man, come on. And we know for a fact, when you look at what's going on in the industry today, 90 plus percent of this industry is made up by Caucasian males. You know, women, African-Americans, people of color barely have a, a toehold in this industry. And, you know, we, we talk about social equity. Social equity is another thing. It's just really another bullshit term. Excuse my mouth, but it's just a straight up bullshit term. Let's hire, let's try to find a guy's name and stick him on the, the application with us. And as soon as we get the application approved, see you later, homeboy. Here's five dollars. Have a nice day. Or here's 50. No, here's twenty thousand dollars. Oh, yeah, that's a that's a high big chunk. Hey, ain't nothing. Give him twenty thousand bucks to go away. But I needed your name to, to get me passed so that I could get my license. So. I mean, I, I, I just wonder what what if you put your crystal ball on having worked in this as long as you have, do you think there's going to be some significant change this next year or the following year or maybe even before the election when it comes to allowing people to uh, or, or to uh, legalizing or changing, you know, uh, uh, scheduling? So I don't think so. Um, I, I mean, just what I know about um the the ways in which uh the the agencies um do their rulemaking you know even if they were to propose a uh, a regulation for example that sought to reschedule from one to three i mean that's generally an 18 month process given the requirements for public comment and the like so i so personally will this conversation continue and will i think it be amplified this year absolutely because i think it serves a very uh, important political purpose, really, really for both sides, but but certainly for Democrats. But do I anticipate that over the course of the next twelve months, um, that um, we'll see like regulatory development that'll result in rescheduling before the end of the year? I, I can't see that happening just because of um, how slow moving that that process would be. But when, I, I, when, when, when you said you said you know public comment, I mean public comment is out there. We got over ninety five percent of the American population population right now. I saw I saw a number that was like ninety four point one that said that ninety four point one of the U S. populace believes that cannabis should be made legal for medical purposes, and we finally broke seventy percent when it comes to for adult use. So I mean I don't know how many more comments we need to get. I don't know how many more polls we need to take. I mean, if you take as many of them as you want, it's still going to come out the same. Uh, well, yeah. well, for 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 your um for for your listeners and watchers that may not know, anytime a, a federal agency like HHS or the FDA, which is a part thereof, um, issues publishes writes a new or revises a regulation, there's a legally required period of time in which the public can comment, usually written in written form. 
um, to the agency. So, so that's um, that. That's what I mean. There's just some formal legal process there that I don't think is going to happen over the course of the, the the next year, even if there was political will. But I agree with you. We we have finally seen the the public opinion on this. Um, uh, you know, really, really, really reflect what we know and understand with regard to um, uh, how familiar are people with cannabis, how people, how much people understand um, its r relative safety vis-a-vis -vis other um, uh, drugs and substances that are perfectly legal, and how outdated and antiquated our cannabis laws um, have been and continue to be. Um, as we get into this like weird liminal space now, right, where um, the vast majority of people, I think, across this country think cannabis is um, uh, either either legal where they are or very much deprioritized, except in those pockets where um, we know that police, that courts, cops and corrections are still very activist. Act, act and, 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 and let's make sure nobody is even talking about it. Nobody's even discussing it the right way. But I think that in those places, we've got to look at the reason why the cops and those administrators or, or, or forces down there continue to, you know, uh, um, you know, enforce the draconian laws because they know that that's the only way you can get black people off the street and stick them in a prison. I mean, let, let's let's stop mixing words about this. Places like Kentucky that legalized because of the hemp bill, they wanted to make sure that their farmers down there could get back in a position that they were in you know, 50 years ago, 60 years ago. You know, most people don't understand that. You know, we keep looking at the Golden Triangle up in Northern California and or one Southern Washington State as if that's where you know we've we've had the most cannabis growth, which is a lie, because we know that most of the cannabis, the, some of the largest you know, uh, supplies of cannabis back in the 60s and the 70s came from Kentucky, came from the middle of the South. But, you know, um, and, and they were, of course, that's the reason why, you know, uh, the, the uh, Senate Majority Leader, Mitch McConnell, decided to push so hard to pass the, the farm bill because he knew it was going to benefit his folks in Kentucky without saying so. So the truth is, I mean, I think, you know, what, first off, what do you think would happen? Let's, let's, let's make this up. Let's, let's act as if, you know, the DEA reschedules and they did it next week. Uh, what kind of impact do you think that would have on the existing cannabis protocol programs going on in multiple in the 38 states around the country in the District of Columbia? The first thing that comes to mind is, you know, and I, I, I'm, I'm thinking a lot through the lens of the New York market. Um, you know, we put, um, and I know you, you, you uh, deride that term social equity, but we put elements in that um, at least attempted to be very forward with um, having, you know, whether it restorative restorative justice aspects in the criminal legal system uh, pieces. Uh, restorative justice aspects in the the economic opportunity pieces, um, and of course in in recapturing some of the tax revenue. And I think places like Illinois, Massachusetts, Maryland, to some degree, kind of went that way, as opposed to um, some of the other places like the Oklahomas, Mississippi's, Florida's of the world. Um, and so, for those states that have attempted to set up, um, you know, programs that do preference, uh, you know, in state. Uh, small producers that uh, seek to preference, um, you know, folks who have borne the brunt of um, uh, uh, over policing and, and over criminalization um, to at least have opportunities on the front end. I think I, I think those are all at risk, um, right? When um, the, the 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 walls come down, if you will, and interstate commerce happens, um, I think preference for in-state um, residents generally. We see all these lawsuits right now. I'm um, trying to raise the 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 dormant commerce clause um, as a way to 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 allow folks to to get into markets that they have no real relationship with other than seeing a a, a high potential for profit. Um, and and I think it it opens the door for um, you know folks who move in 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 our economy simply to aggregate. Um, you know, businesses as value assets, um, and so it kind of gets wrapped up in the, um, the 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 very concentrated ownership uh, model that we see across so many industries, um, and and of course that threatens um, 
the opportunity for a lot of this um, current and potential value in the market um, to devolve uh, down to uh, small operators, which we know, of course, generates economy in um, you know local communities. But, well, yeah, so when, I, when, when you say that, I mean, okay, so let's say that the DEA goes ahead and reschedules the Schedule Three, making it a prescribable drug meaning that now I can go to CVS and get it. So CVS is going to get in the business. Walmart's going to get in the business. All the big guys who are in the business and, and this whole dispensary model goes away. I, I think that's a big risk. Um, and that's what I mean when I say sort of, you know, you see the, the Walmarts and the Targets and the CVSs um, really, um, they're hands off, but they're eyes on, right? You know, um, they won't sponsor, um, uh, uh, educational events or those kinds of things that are in their corporate philanthropy wheelhouse when it relates to cannabis, even though there are all of these other um, things that speak to some of the values that they uh, claim to ascribe to as responsible corporate citizens, uh, they won't touch this because it's cannabis related. They won't touch economic opportunity. Uh, they won't touch these things that are cannabis related, but they have their eyes open, right? And they know um, as you, as you um, bring forth, like, there's real opportunity here, um, definitely in terms of an activated consumer base um, and the potential to grow that consumer base. They realize all the work that um, has been done to destigmatize um, work that they can free ride off of uh, once um, the markets open up in a way that they're accustomed to, to operate again. Um, and so I do think there is a real risk that um, uh, big business, um, and we are talking about like Amazon and the Uber Eats of the world and, and sort of those folks that can get out in the distribution marketplace and really take away um, the the opportunity for small business. Um, so it's going to be, it's, it's a fight now, right? Like we look at New York and the ecosystem and um, who we have encircling, who we have exercising political power now that a foundation of a market has been developed. And I think that's only amplified at the federal level. Um, as these conversations continue and as um, the lobbying arms, as the government relations folks, as the lawyers, as the financiers of these big companies start to put cannabis on the agenda for themselves in a very uh, in a very real way. You know, let's let's talk a little bit about the New York model, because I've, I've literally been a little confused about what's going on there. Um, I mean, like right now, I have cannabis in the marketplace in Massachusetts. And I'm about to get in the marketplace in Georgia. And in Georgia, a very, very interesting paradigm. Georgia, they passed a bill that allows for medical consumption, but you can't smoke it and you can't vape it. It has to be in either tincture form or in pill or tablet or uh, a gel cap form or external salve use. But right across the street from the dispensaries that are licensed dispensaries in the state, you got a bodega or a, you know, a little 7-Eleven or a little gas station that's selling, you know, THC-8 or selling other, you know, hemp-based products out in the open, just just completely selling as if they, and they don't care because nobody's policing that. Some of these bodegas even have the nerve to put a sign that says dispensary in their window. And they're not a dispensary, but they're selling cannabis products. And in New York, I thought that was kind of weird, too, because I'm telling you, you can walk along the streets in Manhattan and, you know, walk into any bodega, or go to some of those little, those little portable things that are hanging on the street and find, you know, some THC-8 and some other questionable products that are in the market up there. So, I mean, I, I just I, what's going on in New York? That's a big question, um, but I'll start uh where where you uh, where you started, and that's with um, just what's the consumer experience like um, here? Um, so you know the the law went into effect April one in, of two thousand twenty one, um, and so that made uh, possession uh, uh, lawful um, and did a bunch of other things with regard to expungement and, and resentencing stuff. Um, and then of course, in our own way, descheduled cannabis with regard to New York, the New York State Controlled Substances Act. Um, and then we had this very long period of, of um, dormancy, if you will, where um, the former governor um, failed to make any appointments to the Cannabis Control Board or the Office of Cannabis Management. And so 
um, you know, there was this period of time where the sort of essentials in order to to establish the function to start the the market um, just didn't happen. And but so, while that, but, 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 but let's let's also say to people and let them know that during that period of dormancy, from the government standpoint, cannabis was thriving in New York City, especially in Manhattan. You can think the illicit market was probably bringing in who knows. I mean, you know, they, you could get cannabis long before there was deliveries in other places in the country. So you could have cannabis delivered anywhere you wanted in Manhattan, street corners if you want. Well, well that's an important um important thing to raise, right? So a couple of things are happening, right? One is um, weed is legal, right? So 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 people understand that to be that like, not only can I consume and possess, but if I see a store, I guess it's legal, I can go in and, and purchase it as well. So there isn't a question in the consumer's mind um, necessarily. It was also a period where we were still pretty locked down um, in New York. There were a massive amount of, um, you know, retail closures, during that time. And so, you know, you've been in New York before. It's like, if you got the money, then, you know, I'm not making it here. So as a landlord, as a commercial landlord, you just had a lot of availability and a real need to like figure out how to, um, to, to, to show up your finances during this period of time when they were just bleeding money. Also, the NYPD specifically weren't su super interested in enforcing one because they claimed they didn't know if they had any enforcement power but two, we had just greater degree of issues um, in the city during that period of time. And you can you can walk if you walked along the streets of Manhattan. If you walk along the streets of Manhattan right now, every third step you're getting a waft. Well, you don't even have to you don't have to fire nothing up. You can just walk down the street and catch a bus. Exactly. And so and so then and and what you also mentioned, right? Which is even before legalization, New York had probably the most um, sophisticated um, and accessible. Um, legal market delivery services. You talk about the bodega. I mean, I moved to New York in 2007. Like, I bought my weed at Ralph's, which is down the block, you know? Um, and so I think all of these things sort of existed and, and they came together. Now, I will say um, in New York, we, we see what's happening um, different. We, we think the legacy market is not what we're seeing in terms of these stores popping up on every corner, right? There's a true legacy market. Um, the, 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 the folks who had distribution networks and relationships, et cetera. And then we have this, um, the vast majority of these storefronts are really um, uh, a proliferation of, of opportunists, right? Who are taking advantage of this very, um, uh, specific circumstance where we had this very long lag time between legalization and the setting up of the market. And I think those are two different groups of people that are, those are two different things. Um, and it's really important for us to recognize the latter because I think it gives us um, as a community something to target um, that's really not us, right? But also um, a way to um, do something that um, folks really don't have the appetite to do, which is to give folks a little bit more enforcement. Um, well, you know, but also we also know, and I know the police departments up there, you know, NYPD understands that, you know, that opened the door to allow organized crime to proliferate in that space. These are legacy crime individuals who've been around since, you know, the thirties, you know, and some of those organizations have literally decided to jump both feet into cannabis and ensuring that some of the places that they own property, you know, are allowing for me. You got, you got places in Manhattan where, you know, I guess you still have, you, you're allowed. I, I don't even understand the law there. Are you allowed to have consumption facilities in the city? No. So, so but there's, no, we're doing it anyway. Like, this. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and yeah, so there, there's no, um, regulation for, um, cons sort of on site consumption, if you will. Um, and so because we have such liberal sort of consumption rules to begin with, um, I think that there's enough space in the law and regs for people to, um, do consumption on site at certain events that are legally compliant. I think when you talk about being indoors, you run afoul of um, uh, public health laws. So that's really the backstop there. But but it's uh, and, and it's obviously the sales piece of it. You know, obviously you're supposed to be licensed to to, to retail sales. So the on site consumption piece is 
Um, but it's going to be a big, big part of the market here um, because of the tourism uh, aspect. Because again, a lot of people don't have other places where they can consume because they live in private apartments, they live in NYCHA housing, et cetera. So I think it's, people are trying to figure out a way to um, make, make that make uh, financial sense. Um, but in the interim, yeah, you know, it's, 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 um, it's kind of a free for all here now. And I don't know that that's in some ways like a bad thing, certainly on the retail side, we need to get that together. But I do think there's space for ingenuity and innovation. And, and I would, wouldn't want us to um, overcorrect on some of these things and, and miss out on that quintessential sort of New York thing, which is new thought, new creativity. Um, over overcorrection will just expand in the proliferation. I think if they try to overcorrect, it's going to just blow up. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, I worry too. You know, about the 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 ways in which um, certain actions can perpetuate stigma, and and so. You know, you talk about Manhattan and all these unlicensed shops. I live in in Brooklyn and Bed Stuy, um, and and there are hundreds here. And I think it's important for us to think about um, the interest, right? And you, you hit your, the nail right on the head. You know, I've been complaining, and my neighbors and folks who are active locally have been complaining for years about commercial vacancies: Bedford Avenue, Nostrand Avenue, Tompkins Avenue. Right? These are places in a historically black neighborhood where landlords are intentionally allowing these commercial properties to go vacant as the real estate values drive uh, uh, increase, right? But what does that do for our like community safety? What does that do for the, the well-being of our community right now? Um, and so you see a lot of these empty commercial properties, they're empty intentionally, and now they're being filled with, you know, pop-up dispensaries, unlicensed dispensaries, um, which do, could, can draw undesirable elements, right? We just had an issue two blocks over where two young people working at a dispensary, two young Black people working at a dispensary owned by a non-Black person, in a building owned by a non-Black person who were just robbed uh, and shot, right? So so now we're starting to see on a, a hyper community level, like, what are some of the other issues that are manifesting um, as we look at how this market is being developed? And so like, I think we just got to be very conscious that we don't um, recreate um, the stigmatic disparity. So that to your point, right? Like as we move into federal legalization, as we move into expanding the market, you can't have folks like Mitch McConnell and those folks out in Kentucky going like, this cannabis use, this kind of engagement is okay. Um, but we still have a problem of young black people standing on the corner smoking and, and find a way to recriminalize in that way. And as an industry, I think um, that's that's a big responsibility of of these, particularly um, uh, early adopters who found a lot of market success off the backs of the work of of advocates. Yes, absolutely. So again, I, I'm, I'm almost out of time, my friend. But um, anything else you want to add? Certainly, just to tell folks, like um, you know, here in New York, uh, our company on the Revel is really um, uh, about uh, democratizing legal market, cannabis market information. Um, and so, you know, we have events, uh, we have uh, content on our digital platforms, um, but but our, our big um, you know, collaboration over competition, you know, first, and, you know, this is a incredibly challenging um, uh, market to be in, endeavor to, 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 uh, approach. Um, but I do think there's a whole range of uh, opportunities for us to really, um, particularly in the policy space, because that's where I am, uh, really utilize this as um, a way for us to be innovative and thoughtful uh, in a variety of other areas of public life um, as we try to figure out a way to both account for um, very real, specific, identifiable, measurable uh, harms occasioned by states and localities on Black and Brown folks and communities, uh, and also try to be innovative and create like solutions. Like this industry, this market is a great place to do it. I don't know if we're going to be successful. I may be really Pollyannish about my optimism on on what we might be able to learn uh, and adapt to other areas of life, um, but I think it's worth it 
Um, and I think we're, we're making an attempt in New York to, um, uh, to, to be a leader in that effort, you know, regardless of, of um, 20, 30, 40 years from now, whether we'll look back and call it a success or not. Right, right. Well, okay, my friend, I, I, I got to thank you for being here and being just a repository of just really unbelievable information. I'd love to have you back sometime if you ever want to come back. Absolutely, absolutely. This is a, um, I, I mentioned I was a, a kid of the 90s. I was a talk show kid too. So um, this is a uh, point of personal privilege. It's great to, to, to be able to chat with you like so many others have over the years. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate that. Well, we will reach out to see if we can get you back on. We have a little bit more time and we can kind of talk through some more issues related to let's let's keep our fingers crossed that somebody does something correctly this year, you know, even though maybe for nefarious reasons, but get it done. And I mean, I I personally, just from your perspective, do you think rescheduling or do you think descheduling? Oh, descheduling, a hundred percent. Um, you know, I, I think what you what you laid out at the top. Um, was really good, which is, you know, nutraceuticals, nutritional supplements. I mean, we have a, a bit of a framework to make sure uh, that we can ensure consumers are getting um, what they intend to get when they're ingesting a product that they know what it, the ingredients are um, and that they can source, you know, where it came from. So all these all these consumer protections, you know, if you go buy an apple from the grocery store, you can look at that sticker, go and figure out where it was, um, uh, where and how it was produced if you so choose. So so we don't need to overregulate this thing. Um, and I do, I do agree with you that if we move into um, sort of framing this as a pharmaceutical project, we're just opening our, our product, excuse me, we are definitely opening ourselves up for uh, complete capture by um, an industry and individuals who have no desire um, to see anything restorative with regard to this plant, or or I don't think really have any um, of the same values and experience with with regard to broad access um, as those of us who um, uh, have been on this journey for much longer have developed. And again, I believe that anybody who has said no for thirty years and today says yes, I don't trust them. That's <laughs> fair. <laughs> It's just me. That's fair. <laughs> hey, well, brother, you stay well. Take care of yourself. Love and family of yours. And we'll catch you around the next time, okay? So, Jason, real quick, before we get out of here, man, why don't you give everybody your stats? How can they get a hold of you? Where do they go? Oh, absolutely. You can find me on uh, Instagram, uh, Twitter, at uh, Jason E. Star, two R's, J-A-S-O-N-E-S-T-A-R-R. -R. Uh, and uh, on the Revel. Uh, again, on Instagram uh, at on the revel O N T H E R E V E L, uh, where you'll have links to uh, our website, YouTube page, learn about uh, all of our events um, and and the like. And you have plenty of events coming up over the next year, do you not? We do, we do. We have um, so we 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 just started a, a monthly industry night, which we're really excited about. I tell all of our uh, bud tenders and uh, folks who are working uh, across our, our burgeoning industry now, it's an opportunity for you to turn your consumer facing uh, function off for a bit uh, and meet, network, celebrate uh, and, and figure out your own growth strategy. Um, and then of course we have our marquee events, uh, our revelry conference uh, and uh, our revelry blog party, which is our love letter to community. And then this year we'll also be doing revelry buyers club, which is our trade show that we launched um, last year. So we are uh, your clearinghouse for all things New York cannabis. Like I said before, we don't have everything that you need, but you can trust us to treat you well and get you connected um, to where uh, whoever you need to get connected to as you start your New York cannabis journey. You got it, my friend. Well, thank you so much for being a part of the show. You take care of yourself, love and family of yours. We'll see you the next time. And I want to thank all of you out there for tuning in to this edition of Let's Be Blunt with Montel. Thanks for joining me on Let's Be Blunt with Montel. Please make sure you're subscribed and hit the bell to be notified when new episodes post each week. We'd love to hear your feedback also, so please send us your comments.